We are all present and virtual. I'm very happy to welcome you on behalf of the Max Planck Society on the occasion of this joint press conference of the Max Planck Society and the Anthropocene Working Group. We meet here today for the announcement of the chosen candidate site for the Global Boundary Stratotype Section and Point in short, GSSSP, GSSP, or Golden Spike. This Golden Spike will be a reference point for marking the beginning of the Anthropocene, if the Anthropocene will be definitely decided upon as a geological time span by the responsible international bodies. Today is an important milestone within this process of formalizing the Anthropocene. The concept Anthropocene has been ref or re refers to the global impact of humanity, which has dramatically changed our home planet, the Earth. For more than 20 years, the Anthropocene concept has been widely discussed within the sciences, the humanities, and the broader public, because it makes us aware that humans have become a geological force, responsible not just for climate change, but also for biodiversity loss and massive environmental destruction. Its official acceptance as part of the geological timescale anchors this awareness in rock solid scientific evidence. Those who are responsible for this proposal of the chosen candidate of the chosen candidate site join us from Lille in France. They are members of the Anthropocene Working Group, currently participating in the fourth International Congress on Stratigraphy in Lille. Today also marks a final moment of a long-standing and fruitful collaboration between the Anthropocene Working Group, the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science, and the Haus der Kulturen der Welt. That is why Bernd Scherer and Katrin Klingan will join us here in a moment. Together, our three bodies have worked for more than 10 years under the joint umbrella of the Anthropocene project to help developing the Anthropocene literacy, spur science, and involve public actors in a growing awareness debate, culminating within the Max Planck Society with the establishment of a new interdisciplinary institute for geoanthropology in Jena. As many of you know, it was Paul Crutzen, Nobel Prize winner and director at the Max Planck Institute for Chemistry, who first articulated the term in the year 2000 at a conference in Mexico. In two subsequent conferences that happened here in Dahlem, actually, in the early 2000s, the Anthropocene hypothesis was readily taken up and further developed by, coin by coining the term great acceleration, referring to the exponential rise of parameters characterizing both the Earth system and global human society in the middle of the 20th century. In 2009, the Anthropocene Working Group was established by the Subcommission on Quaternary Stratigraphy of the International Commission on Stratigraphy, a committee that oversees the standards and requirements of the ongoing review and completion of the geological timescale to seek stratigraphic evidence for the Anthropocene hypothesis. And that is what we are going to see very clearly today. The task of the Anthropocene Working Group is, and I quote, to examine the status, hierarchical level, and definition of the Anthropocene as a potential new formal division of the geological timescale." End of quote. In 2013, the collaboration between the Haus der Kulturen der Welt, the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science and the Anthropocene Working Group, started with the development and realization of the Anthropocene project. It was in this context that the Anthropocene Working Group held its first in-person meeting in Berlin. More meetings followed, including a meeting at Paul Crutzen's former institute, 
the Max Planck Institute for Chemistry in Mainz in the year 2018. In the same year, the Haus der Kulturen der Welt secured funding to facilitate the examination of possible GSSP candidate sites. Without that funding, we would not be here tonight. Since 2019, the Anthropocene Working Group coordinated a systematic collection and analysis of core samples from around the globe, from which we will hear more about from our colleagues in Lille. After several rounds of voting, the Anthropocene Working Group has now decided upon a site and sample that will soon forward, be forwarded to the Subcommission on Quaternary Stratigraphy as their proposal for a potential Anthropocene golden spike. Let me now introduce the members of the panel here in Berlin. Uh, and we are joined by Dr. Bernd Scherer, who has been director of the Haus der Kulturen der Welt uh, from 2006 to 2022, and has held an honorary professorship at the Institute for European Ethnology at the Humboldt University of Berlin since 2011. His key areas of work lie in philosophy, semiotics, aesthetics, and intercultural questions. As the director of the Haus der Kulturen der Welt in Berlin, Bernd Scherer was responsible for the momentous shift of focus of this prominent cultural institution towards question of the Anthropocene. And we all are really thankful for his initiative, his efforts, his ingenuity, and that of his entire team to turn the topic of the Anthropocene into a truly transdisciplinary and global debate. He was joined and is joined tonight by Katrin Klingan, a literary scholar, curator, and producer of art and cultural projects, who was department head at the Haus der Kulturen der Welt between 2011 and 2022, and she was instrumental in implementing uh, this very ambitious project. In her capacity as the head of the department, she has curated public projects exploring the entanglement between human culture natural environments and global technologies, as well as structures of inequality and asymmetric power relations. Since 2013, together with Christoph Rosol from the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science, she has headed the Anthropocene Curriculum Project, an international network and research project that experimentally and collaboratively explored pathways towards, <clears throat> towards a new interdisciplinary culture of knowledge and education. From Lille, Colin Water will join us. He is honorary professor at the Geography, Geology and Environmental School of the University of Leicester and has formerly worked at the British Geological Survey for nearly 30 years. Colin Waters has been secretary of the Anthropocene Working Group since 2011 and its chair since 2020. His work has led to broadening interest in assessment of the Anthropocene as a geological epoch, particularly in helping to quantify its scale, the importance of specific markers for correlation, notably plutonium, and establishing the collaboration with the Haus der Kulturen der Welt on the current global uh, golden spike assessment. Also joining us from Lille is Dr. Simon Turner, who is Senior Research Fellow in Geography, also at, no, at the University College London, and has been Secretary of the Anthropocene Working Group since 2020. In this capacity, he was also the scientific coordinator of the collaborative project funded by the Haus der Kulturen der Welt to seek a global GSSP for the Anthropocene. For over 25 years, Simon has been unearthing sedimentological stories from aquatic sediments and decoding what they can tell us about recent environmental change. Simon specializes in applying multiple physical, chemical, paleoecological, and statistical analyses to investigate the changing composition of sediments and materials they contain, illustrate the range of human activities that can be identified, how significant human impacts were in the past, especially in the last century, and how legacy historical contam contaminants persist in contemporary ecosystems. So after this 
introduction, I would like to hand over the word to Bernd Scherer. Please, Bernd. Thank you very much, Jürgen, for this kind introduction. Why is a cultural institution like the HKW, Haus der Kultur in der Welt, interested in the Golden Spike and the Anthropocene? In 2010, we asked ourselves what a cultural institution should look like in the 21st century. Quickly, we realized that it was no longer a matter of showcasing other cultures in Berlin, which was the role originally assigned to the HKW. The accelerating speed at which our life giving environments are being transformed generated an urgent need, not only to understand these processes, but to intervene in them, since the very existence of humanity and that of other species depends on them. During our research, we came upon the Anthropocene thesis. We immediately contacted Jan Salasiewicz and Colin Waters of the Anthropocene Working Group, AWG, who from the very beginning expressed their willingness to collaborate with us. At the same time, we developed an intense working relationship with the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin and one of its directors, Jürgen Renn. The Anthropocene thesis, and Jürgen Renn uh, mentioned that already, can essentially be summarized as follows. Human beings as a species are becoming the greatest force of nature. Humankind is not just changing the planet, but destabilizing the Earth system, altering the planetary metabolism of the Holocene status quo that has been dominant since at least the end of the last ice age. While the AWG, who is researching the evidence for the formalization of the Anthropocene, is focused on the processes of material change on a planetary scale, we at the HKW saw it as our task to highlight the Anthropocene's challenges to our cultural imagery, narratives, and systems of representation. One important implication of the Anthropocene thesis as put forward by the natural scientists is that their subject, nature, is now essentially a product manufactured by humankind. It is a result of human activity and hence of culture. This means that the object of scientific investigations has changed fundamentally, that it is an object in which natural and cultural processes are increasingly intertwined. This conjunction also highlights that the disciplinary boundaries between the natural sciences on the one hand and the humanities and social sciences on the other hand, a split that mainly developed in the 19th century, is proving inadequate for the purposes of addressing the phenomena of the Anthropocene. For the work of the HKW, this implies that it is not sufficient to examine the material implications of the processes of planetary transformation, but that we have to conceive new forms of knowledge production. In January 2013, we launched the Anthropocene project. At the opening conference, a range of artistic interventions and scientific papers were developed highlighting that the Anthropocene hypothesis is not just about one of many scientific issues, but about developing new ways of thinking. Additionally, we invited representatives from important research institutions to a forum of the open, at the opening, asking them to develop strategies for the future. The forum was attended, among others, by scientists of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Change, the Environmental Humanities Lab of the Royal Institute of Technology at Stockholm, the Institute Michel Serre at the and the Complex System Institute of the École Normale Supérieure de Lyon. In the years after the opening, HKW, together with the uh, Max Planck Institute for the History of Science and other partners, developed projects which were focused on generating new forms of knowledge production in which scientific strategies merge with artistic and social forms of knowledge creation. These normal forms of knowledge arise both from the critical analysis of the emerging scientific findings concerning the Anthropocene and from development in artistic and social production. First, sciences. 
science and its technological offshoots were not on the sidelines during the Great Acceleration from around 1950. Rather, scientific research and its technological applica applications drove the acceleration of human-made impacts on the Earth. The creation of these techno-scientific worlds and hence the transformation of our social world has accelerated to such a degree in recent decades that ultimately only a handful of experts in science and industry have true insight into the inner workings of these new worlds. Against this background, a fundamental change of perspective is called for, one that reorganizes that all people are affected, that, that recognizes that all people are affected either directly or indirectly by these developments. At the same time, we have to acknowledge that the people directly affected by the Anthropocene and its repercussions, be they people whose crops have failed due to drought or people whose land is contaminated by chemicals, are the real experts in their own way of life. As a consequence, the knowledge possessed by these social players must be included in the development of new forms of knowledge development. This means we need a form of democratic knowledge production. At the same time, the Anthropocene world, which is changing ever faster due to increasing knowledge and increasing human impacts on the planet, also represents a major challenge for the scientific world divided by its disciplines. That implies that the categories, concepts, and modes of perception we developed during the Holocene are not any more adequate. The arts play an important role in this context in providing new accesses to the world. Many artists consciously abandon the well-defined spaces of art museums to experience new realities and explore new aesthetic languages. Here you see a photo by Armin Linke. This is a photo from the Ara Lake in Uzbekistan, which has dried up because of climate change and forced people to carry water over long distances. This is a photo from southern Spain, a place where they grow tomatoes. Instead of a garden, we see a machine. In order to release the imaginative potential hidden in our encounters with reality, artists quite often blur the borderline between reality and fictions in their aesthetic language. This work is a uh, is part of a series by the artist Pina Yoldas imagining how the digestive organ of a plastic eating living being in the ocean may look like and the world of plastic could be transformed into new, new forms of life. This combination of scientific with aesthetic and social scientific research methods became the central mission of the HKW. But the most important aspect of the HKW's work over the past decade has been showcasing the sciences involving in conceptualizing the Anthropocene. The group central to this endeavor is, of course, the Anthropocene Working Group. An essential part of gathering this evidence was taking course samples from various locations around the globe and measuring a range of biological and chemical indicators in order to define the golden spike. Since the AWG did not have the necessary, necessary funds, uh, it envisaged, uh, envisaged, uh, I envisioned an important and unusual role for the HKW. After consulting with the AWG, I raised the sum of 1 million euros. Uh, Jürgen mentioned that already. The HKW support for the AWG's research was ultimately supplied by the German government through a special appropriation by the Deutsche Bundestag in, 19, in 2019. The AWG, in return for this funding, agreed to allow the HKW access to the core samples and the results of their analysis for the development of cultural projects. The funding provided the basis for an ever more intense collaboration between the natural scientists and the cultural institutions in the HKW. These forms of corporations are fundamental in an anthropocenic world where cultural and natural processes are becoming completely intertwined. Now uh, we will hear from Katrin Klinger, my colleague, 
a more precise way uh, how this project looked like. Good evening. I have the pleasure to give you a very brief insight into the final program of our decade-long collaboration. It took place last year at Haus der Kultur und der Welt and the Anthropocene Working Group's research formed the center. We call this program Evidence and Experiment because we believe in the face of the urgent political challenges of this new epoch, finding the nexus between the production of evidence and the outlining of the scope of experimentation and social maneuvering is essential. And that's precisely what we were interested in, in this uncharted space between what is given and the collective search for adequate responses. The base of our activities was the exhibition Earth Indices that you can see already at the image here. We invited the artists Julia Bruno and Armin Linke to accompany the GSSB research process. The result of this intensive learning and documenting process was an artistic large format index card system. In the spirit of Latourian laboratory studies, the exhibition questioned the research process and made it visible and tangible in its mediated condition. Earth indices shows photographs, field recordings, sketches, scans and data sets, annotations and logbook-like notes from all phases of the research. This is still an un finished process and we are very happy that uh, Julia Bruno is with us tonight. She's up there documenting this event as well and will continue in future uh, together with Armin um, this process. On the occasion of the opening, we organized a more day program around the GSSB analysis. We wanted to know what do the sediments of Earth tell us about the present and about the actions and decisions we have to take today. To give an example, Francine McCarthy, the main investigator of the Crawford Lake GSSB site, gave a core reading, the core you can see in front of her at the table. She explored how the varved sediment of Crawford Lake record nuanced signals from human activity throughout the last centuries, from indigenous community settlements to the effects of the 1930 Dust Bowl to the increased industrial activities uh, during World War II and the environmental regulation efforts in the 1970s. In conversation with scholars here at the image, you see um, Michelle Murphy and the Anthropocene Working Group member Mark Williams and colleagues from the Crawford Lake. They discussed how processes of settlement and land use shape both human and earth histories and how this influenced the present locality of Crawford Lake and what consequences they took out of this. Based on these many research discussions, a second event turned Haus der Kulturen der Welt's auditorium over the course of three days into an experimental rehearsal room for collective planetary practice. Whereas the planetary was a collaborative search for models of living together on Earth. Along central questions of habitability, the artist Koki Tanaka designed experimental settings in which Anthropocene Working Group scientists, artists and activists searched ways to transform the multitude of perspectives and cosmologies into a common agency. Here we see the group who explored the conditions of habitability while cooking different soups that materially and symbolically dealt with particular planetary limitations. Another group investigated planetary damage and explored what can be repaired and for whom. During several hours, they built this shelter that you can see from a material mound, cultural debris from former Hakavi displays. In this shelter, they shared related stories to the planetary damage as well as the physical labor around shaping and repairing. I still recall Liz Hadley during an Anthropocene Working Group research meeting at Haus der Kultur und der Welt in 2019 saying that working with this material is life-changing. Yes, indeed, 
That's what we experience exploring the Anthropocene strata as a collaborative practice between fields, disciplines, and our daily lives supports the space of a, sh of a shared planetary practice for addressing the challenges of the present. So our work continues, even in different forms and constellations. If you're interested, please follow us in future as well. We, which is my colleagues with whom I had the pleasure to organize and produce these project throughout the last years, and I, we would like to heartfully thank the Anthropocene Working Group and the many GSSB researchers for this extraordinary collaboration and openness to perform the constant traffic between Earth's history and world history. Thank you. So as this is a truly global event, we change over to uh, Lille now, to the conference in Lille. I hope uh, the technology works. And I would now like to ask uh, first uh, Simon, Simon Turner, and uh, then Colin Waters, whom I already introduced, to take the floor. Thank you, Jürgen. I hope everyone can hear me in Berlin and online around the world, wherever you are. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, we've been talking about this day for, me, for many years, it seems, and it is astonishing to be here. So um, thank you very much. I'm just going to go through uh, very quickly some more detail on how we find ourselves here and the methods in which the Anthropocene Working Group have worked and, and how we uh, come to this decision. So the launch of the concept of the Anthropocene by Paul Crutzen in 2000 crystallised the understanding that human activities have fundamentally changed the Earth system. This use of the term Anthropocene was then used to describe a new planetary condition. In direct comparison to the Holocene because of the inferred geological significance of the now altered Earth system. By 2006, increasing use of the term in the geological community and an analysis by the Stratigraphy Commission of the Geological Society of London suggested that the term had merit and should be studied with respect to potential formalisation as a stratigraphic unit. Following this, an invitation was made by the Subcommission of Quaternary Stratigraphy of the International Commission on Stratigraphy to set up a formal Anthropocene working group to examine the case of formalisation. Small working groups have always been put together by subcommissions to investigate new or appraise, reappraise existing boundaries of geological time units. The International Commission of Stratigraphy has since the 1970s worked to formalise boundaries of geological time using global stratotype section and points, GSPs, GSSPs or golden spikes. This shown here is the current international chronostratigraphic chart with the GSE, GSSPs marking the nested boundaries of geological time units with their ages on the right hand side of the coloured columns. Since 2009, the Anthropocene Working Group has been developing and testing the general case for the Anthropocene as a formal geological time unit. Since its inception, the AWG has also included non-geologists due to the importance of the concept outside of geology. 2019 was a pivotal year for the AWG, as a consensus was established that the Anthropocene should be treated as a formal unit and defined by a GSSP, and that the base of the series should mark the mid-20th century. In the same year, supported by House de Culture and Develt in Berlin, this the pace accelerated to investigate and then analyze the geological material to provide the necessary physical evidence of a potential new Anthropocene epoch. The proposed Anthropocene, if ratified, will only form the thinnest of lines at the top of the left-hand column here, but it will represent a significant and profound change in our planet's evolution. So establishing a geological Anthropocene GSSP has to be considered within the rules and guidelines that apply to all other units of the geological timescale. Here, shown on the slide, is a summary of those requirements that make a GSSP. 
It must contain a marker, a stratigraphic marker that defines the lower boundary and allows correlation globally. It must be defined by a change in physical, chemical or fossil content and should be datable. It must be of adequate thickness. It must show continuous sedimentation and it must also be accessible for future research. This is just a summary of some of the points for GSSPs. But just from these requirements, it becomes clear that this geological stratigraphic definition of the Anthropocene distinguishes it from other interpretations of the Anthropocene that have emerged over the last two decades. So the concept of an unprecedented geological transformation having occurred in the last 75 years is a big statement. And understandably, debate continues about the idea, its timing and the concept's inclusivity with the other disciplines. What is, however, undeniable is the geological stratigraphic evidence of this historical change that can be found in environmental archives of sediment, ice, coral, peat and soil globally. These are not rocks, but they are clearly a product of geological processes and are a physical archive of past conditions. These are geological records that span an archaeological historical timescales right up to the present. This is an exercise in stratigraphy. The AWG has coordinated an international collective of scientists to investigate this chronostratigraphic anthropocene at sites known to the teams in many cases where they have worked for many years. They are principally but not exclusively found in remote environmental settings which have allowed environmental change to be recorded by continuous sedimentation. Like any GSSP candidate, stratigraphic, many stratigraphic markers of environmental change have been measured, but in particular for this anthropocene, those indicative of human activity. The requirement of a precise chronology means that we have also sought sites with annual layers that can also be checked by independent radiometric dating methods. A key set of markers being the radionuclides from the atmospheric nuclear weapons testing that provide, in the case of plutonium isotopes, an almost globally synchronous marker of the mid 20th century. This level of chronological precision is unique in the history of GSSPs. So after 14 years, so after 14 years of research, discussion, publications, and an open transdisciplinary collaborative exploration of the Anthropocene with Huck of A and the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science, we now find ourselves ready to announce the location of where the proposed GSSP will be situated. We should applaud the efforts made by the teams of scientists and all people involved with this project. It has been awesome to take part in, and you have all been brilliant. The decision on the site being announced today has been made by 21 voting members of the Anthropocene Working Group. Since November 2022, these members have had three rounds of formal discussions and voting periods to decide on one site. Only in April 2023 was a 60% majority achieved in a very close contest for one site. With a site selected, we are now in the final phase of the Anthropocene Working Group's task, with a submission being prepared of the full proposal, including the precise date and position of the Golden Spike for the Subcommission on Quaternary Stratigraphy. The SQS will then have to review, discuss and vote on this proposal. Only if approved by a 60% majority of SQS voting members will it be moved upwards for consideration by the International Commission on Stratigraphy whose members will also have to consider the submitted proposal and vote. Only with a 60% majority again will it be considered by the IUGS, who will also have to decide on whether to accept it as a formal geological unit. We have therefore some way to go and nothing as yet can be set in stone. We have nonetheless compiled some of the most detailed stratigraphic evidence of how humans have recently modified and impacted ecological and sedimentary systems globally. This chronostratigraphic evidence of unprecedented transformative change in the planet over the last 75 years exists, and the evidence will continue to be encountered, even if in the future it is called a different name and considered of far lesser or greater significance, depending very much on how the next few centuries, millennia, pan out. Thank you. So thank you, Simon. Um, I'll go on to. 
Good. Right. So, first of all, I wish to thank the team at Max Planck Society for coordinating today's events uh, here uh, in Lille and also in Berlin. It's also important that I express the gratitude of the Anthropocene Working Group for the role that the House de Couture and Vivel in Berlin has had in making this work possible, and particularly for the visionary leadership of Bernd Shearer as director of HKV. The AWG, HKV, and the Max Planck Institute have been collaborating for over nearly 10 years. That collaboration has been important in firstly helping to get AWG members to meet face to face and discuss our work internally, but also it has helped to facilitate us as a group to promote our science outside of the academic discussions of stratigraphy to a much wider audience and helps raise the profile of the Anthropocene as a concept. Secondly, as the AWG has no budget, in order to encourage the 12 teams to be involved in developing their sites into suitable GSSP proposals, collaboration with HKV has been essential in allowing us to get where we are today. I truly believe that our function as a working group could not have been completed as rapidly and with such diversity of sites without their collaboration. The 12 sites shown in, in the figure here include a marine anoxic basin in the Baltic Sea, two coastal and estuary settings, that's Beku Bay in Japan and San Francisco Bay in the United States. Three lake successions, so Searsville, also near to San Francisco, Crawford Lake in Ontario, Canada, and Sihalongwan, Ma Lake in China. There are two corals from the Gulf of Mexico and the Flinders Reef of Australia. An ice sheet from Antarctica, the Ernesto Cave Speediofem from Northern Italy, the Snieska Peat from Poland, and the anthropogenic deposits from Vienna. I wish to reiterate how difficult it has been to select a single site from this, given their strength in depth. I think the combination of the data collected from the 12 sites worked together to enforce the compulsive case of the Anthropocene Epoch commencing in the mid 20th century, providing a comprehensive narrative that no one site can possibly do. However, the International Commission on Strategy Protocols require that one GSSP should be proposed as the stratotype for a geological time interval. So now is the time to reveal the winning candidate site. And it is Crawford Lake from Ontario. So I wish to con send my congratulations to everyone uh, involved in the, the team Crawford for their hard work to provide the evidence to support their case. It will be a privilege to put forward the proposal to the Subcommission on Quaternary Stratigraphy with this site as the candidate to GSSP. Yeah. Okay, it's not moving. <laughs> there we go. So, I was asked just to mention a few words why I thought the site had been successful uh, and why so many of the, the members of the working group had supported its case. First of all, the, the figure here shows this exquisite annual lamination uh, with a clear absence of any uh, gaps in the succession, no evidence of bioturbation. Um, it, in effect, provides a, a barcode of the history of the Crawford Lake area, um, which is so exquisitely perfect at annual resolution. It's important also that the succession doesn't show any major changes. So what we're not seeing here is a sudden transition from one fascist to another, which could in effect influence the nature of the signals that we're seeing. So there's a consistency here throughout. Um, so when we look at things like geochemical and biological changes, we know that that's occurred throughout a continuum of deposition. The thickness of the Anthropocene uh, in that particular core is 15.6 centimetres. So it sounds small um, in the context of knowing that geological units can be many hundreds, if not thousands of metres in thickness. But um, in the context of our study, that is sufficient to understand and to see a very dramatic change that's occurred across the 1950s as part of the Great Acceleration. So that 15.6 centimetres has been sufficient to record that dramatic change. It's also important that the, that the millennial scale of the record of 
Late Holocene change is also represented in the core. And this includes this earlier, very distinctive human impact from in indigenous peoples. And I think that's an important story to relate with regard to the history of Crawford Lake. And importantly, the GSSP core is archived in the National Repository, the National Biodiversity Cryobank in Canada. So we know it has safe storage. Importantly, there's been, been many years of research on the site, and, and not only looking at the core of the sediments, but also it's been extensively monitored. So we have that linkage between historical and monitored data with the geological record, so we can have a comparison between one and the other. We know the succession has been very robustly dated, so we can be confident of the, the dating of the, the signals that we're seeing are precise to annual resolution. The plutonium and radiocarbon signals are clear and correlate well with the atmospheric testing record that we know has occurred uh, across the planet. The steroidal carbonaceous particles and nitrogen isotopes change in the early 1950s due to increased fossil fuel combustion. There's a clear biotic response to these anthropogenic activities, supporting evidence of ecosystem change. It's located in a conservation area, but relatively easy to, re to recollect given permissions for any future analysis. And lastly, I suppose, uh, what I'd like to say is probably one of the, the, the greatest and most important impacts has been that of the work of Francine McCarthy herself. Um, she's uh, very much the figurehead for what is a big team at Crawford who've done such amazing work to develop their site. And in the case of Francine, she's gone that extra mile to ensure the success of the proposal. Uh, we all think within the working group, it's been most impressive. So with that, I'd like to ask Francine, uh, Team Crawford team leader, professor at the Brock University to please sit next to me. And, and Martin as well, if you could come up as, as representative of the Subcommission on Quaternary Stratigraphy. Thanks very much, Colin. Should we do clapping? No. <laughs> right, so it's my pleasure to, for the second time today, say out loud in public uh, that Crawford Lake uh, is going to be proposed to the Subcommission on Quaternary, and hopefully they're on up the line as the GS, the golden spike, as we like to call it, for the proposed Anthropocene. And I'll tell you a few things about Crawford Lake that um, we think make it special. Uh, okay. Uh, one, one of the first things I want to mention is its very great depth compared to its uh, perimeter so that we have no turnover of the waters to the bottom. So that allows that that really precise barcoding that Colin referred to, to remain pristine. And it allows us to sample at annual resolution each of these layers and analyze them for a variety of um, proxies or markers. So they are beautiful cores. Uh, each core looks very much like the previous core. And we can see in uh, this slide, what I call the prettiest core that we collected in April 2018 or uh, 2023, but it looks very much like our 2019 cores and every other core that we collected. So uh, currently that is the proposed uh, GSSP core uh, in the Canadian Museum of Nature, but it is possible because we are still considering the exact depth in the core and the exact year, calendar year that we're going to name the base of the proposed Anthropocene within the Anthropocene Working Group. So that has yet to be discussed. We had a beautiful uh, week for our coring event in 2023, which was uh, we were very grateful for. You could never know in Canada what the middle of April is going to look like, but it was absolutely amazing. Typically, we core from the ice surface, but as a reflection of anthropogenic change, in the last few decades, uh, safe ice is not reliable in Canada anymore. So of the 
years that we were able to go coring, not impeded by COVID, not all of them allowed for uh, safe ice, this past one being one of them. But 2022, we were able to collect a uh, few additional cores because by then the cores we'd collected in 2019 were completely consumed. And uh, so um, pretty core, really nice plutonium analysis. The, the analyses from our 2022 proposed GSSP core, as it appears in our Anthropocene review paper, are in black. Uh, the plutonium data, we have two cores on this diagram. In red are our 2019 core samples. In black, the uh, 2022 core samples. So you can see how very, very similar they are. And pasted together, they show that the sharpest rise in plutonium is in 1952. We're uh, using uh, samples from the 2023 core that have been subsampled meticulously at Carleton University at annual resolution. They are currently in Vienna being analyzed by Karen Hain. And uh, so uh, using AMS, so we're using a novel uh, technique to get really good uh, plutonium data from very small samples. But you can see the combination of the, the proxies or, or the kinds of analyses that line up really nicely along that 1950 or 52 or 53. We will discuss that further. Uh, together with the changes in uh, the uh, anthropocene markers, as we call them, the things like the plutonium, the, S the SCPs or fly ash, et cetera. So the radionuclides and the markers of um, uh, the combustion of fossil fuels, we see changes in the lake that respond to those atmospheric changes. So the, the atmospheric changes are passed on to the water, the hydrosphere, that then affect the biosphere and the geosphere so that the, the, the things that live in the lake that become part of the fossil record and the sediments themselves respond very clearly to those changes that are, of course, of, of human making. And it is a reflection of that tipping point in Earth history when the Earth system ceased to behave the way it had for 11,700 years. It's not the first time that there is human impact on Crawford Lake. As Colin mentioned, a very clear indication of human impact from the late 12th through the um, 15th centuries, and then uh, with European colonization and so on. But at, at no point was there globally synchronous shift in the way the Earth behaved until this great acceleration of the mid uh, uh, 20th century. And we see in uh, the data in uh, two different cores, uh, very, very clear changes in the biota and in the sediments at that time. So in addition to the uh, geology that I was privileged to spearhead, uh, because I love going to Crawford Lake and a beautiful course to work with and, and great group of people to work with, I was uh, really, really uh, privileged to work with non-scientists, to work with artists and activists, and as well as social scientists, uh, people in the humanities, and so on. And and I embraced the breadth of Anthropocene uh, investigation, and took part with Simon and Mark in uh, the uh, Where's the Planetary? Uh, there I am in one of those settings. So I, I really reveled in the entire experience and it's the best thing I have ever done. Hmm. Thank you. Martin, anything you wanted to add? I think it's uh, important to consider that this is a, a major milestone in the, the work of the Anthropocene Working Group. Uh, its final step essentially will be to uh, submit a proposal to the to the um, uh, the Quaternary Subcommission. That proposal will it will include the proposal for the GSSP section itself, which is Crawford Lake. It will also include several proposals for uh, auxiliary sites, which will complement the proposed GSSP. But this final proposal will also include 
the other sites that didn't necessarily make the uh, the cut as official auxiliary sections, but which nonetheless contribute to our understanding of the stratigraphic nature of the Anthropocene. I think what's important to appreciate here is that all of the sites that were analyzed by the Anthropocene Working Group have all contributed to our understanding of the global stratigraphic characterization of the Anthropocene. And that's a very important uh, part of the uh, of the proposal, part of the message that the Anthropocene Working Group wants to get across to the next level of scrutiny, which will be the Quaternary Subcommission, of which I am uh, a, one of two vice chairs. So we are looking forward to receiving this final proposal. And then, uh, then will come the very uh, arduous and actually interesting job of going through it in detail and discussing it and, and, and discussing its merits and hopefully then approving it for the next bureaucratic step, which would be the uh, the um, uh, scrutiny by the, uh, the 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 um uh, the voting the voting commission of the international commission on stratigraphy and if they approve the proposal it then finally goes to the executive committee executive committee of the international union of geological sciences hopefully for them to ratify now the next um International Geological uh, Conference will be in Korea, Busan, Korea next year. And our hope is that we will be celebrating the, uh, the, uh, the GSSP for the Crawfordian stage and the Anthropocene series in Busan next summer. That at least is certainly is my hope and of course the hope of the, uh, the, uh, my colleagues on the panel here. So I guess we're opening up for questions now or back to sure. Yeah, thank you, Martin. Thank you, Francine. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, Simon. Uh, so we open the floor now for questions first from the journalist. And the procedure is that we would like to ask you to post your questions in the chat. I will read them aloud then and distribute them to the participants. So I see a first question here in the chat. Uh, I, if there are many, I will try to order them and, and sort them a bit. But uh, here I have a, a first question that I will just read aloud. Very good, but why not to choose the year 1964, where radionuclides are at maximum, especially in Europe? Uh, a plutonium increase is more difficult to ascertain than a maximum peak. Uh, this is a question to our geologist friend in, in Lille. So uh, Colin, Francine, the team over there, can you take up that question, please? Oh, no. We did actually look at, at that issue because there was originally a proposal a few years ago to have the peak radiocarbon signal in tree records as a, a potential GSSP. Um, if, you, if you look at the peak signal, and I think you mentioned it in your question, in Europe, then that might be correct to some degree, but it's not globally correct. I mean, there is definitely a, a, um, a variation with time across the planet as to when the peak is. And particularly with radiocarbon, there is a delay of several years in the Southern Hemisphere. But it's worse than that. If, if you also then consider that there are lags uh, with regard to accumulations in uh, water columns, that that delays the signal as well. Um, it's strange, but it doesn't actually impact the start of the signal. I think it's partly because you get the larger particulates um, transferring the radioisotopes down to the sediment rapidly during that first initial rise uh, in the detonations. Um, the subsequent story is, is potentially then uh, dragged out with time, particularly the, the deeper water column. So, 
what's easy to correlate is the onset of the signal and that, that upturn in plutonium in particular that happens around about 1952, 1953. Um, subsequently, different sites will show different peaks. It is not strictly 1964. And from the uh, Crawford Lake perspective, when we line up our major changes in Anthropocene markers, in biotic markers, it's 1950-ish. Uh, it is not 1964-ish. Yeah. So importantly here, um, the, the reason why we use plutonium is its practicality, uh, not because it's systematic of the record of the Anthropocene. There's the, the, the major impacts of burning fossil fuels, of changing of agricultural practices, and particularly using uh, artificial and nitrogen-based fertilizers. There's the pollution record, the biological changes that all coincide with around about 1950. Um, the bomb spike is just that practical tool we use to help um, guide where we place the base in the Crawford Lake site. Um, and it's not the peak signal in that case that's actually important here. There is another, yeah. There is a uh, there is another issue here as well, and that is that for the general public. Uh, at least, if you explain to them that the, Anthropoc the Anthropocene began in 1952 or 1964, they will ask why. But if you say the Anthropocene began in 1950, they will just well assume that it's a, some sort of convention. So in addition to the, uh, the answers uh, that have already been given, uh, there's also the you know the convenience of having essentially a round number because then you are not locked into having to explain all the arcane details as to why it is or how it is that the anthropocene is actually defined which the general public are not really interested in and and 1950 is a nice round number right in the middle of the great acceleration so it fits nicely with the narrative and it allows us to not have to explain all the arcane details of how the boundary was actually defined by geologists. It's also the present and before present when you get a radiocarbon date back. And so those of us who work with Lake Mud are used to getting our dates back in BP and doing the mi minus 1950 quick math in our heads. So present being Anthropocene, before present being the whole scene, or the rest of the quaternary, actually. So thank you all very much. Uh, you have uh, contributed all to answering this question. There are many more questions in the chat. Uh, and uh, I think the next question is mainly for Martin. In Busan, South Korea, in the summer of 2024, is this when the International yeah. Union of Geological Sciences is expected to Martin? Martin, did you understand? officially designate it? The no. signal's a little bit scrambled here, but... Um, so I can repeat the question. In Busan, South Korea, in the summer of 2024, is this when the International Union of Geological Sciences is expected to ratify? I don't think there is... Um, I don't think expectation is the word. Um, the the um, IUGS Executive Committee can ratify a GSSP at any time. Now, typically what happens after a GSSP has been ratified is that there will be a some, some kind of a ceremony that would acknowledge and uh, commemorate the achievement of that uh, of that ratification. Now, this can be a two step process. Uh, typically, the commemoration would be at the site itself. I've attended one of these myself in uh, Japan a few summers ago. Um, but the uh, at the um, International Geological Congress in Busan uh, next August would be an excellent opportunity to announce to the world the ratification of the Anthropocene GSSP, if that is what happens. That would be in addition to a, a formal ceremony that would be held 
in, uh, in Crawford Lake itself. But it would be a great opportunity to announce to the world and to the world's press that the, uh, that the Anthropocene has been ratified. Of course, whether that happens or not is another matter, but it, the timing would be, would be wonderful because these international geological congresses only occur once every four years. So, you know, it would be very nice if we could have everything, have everything done and dusted and ready for announcing in Busan next summer. So thank you very much, Martin. The next question is for Francine. Last week, Francine, you were announcing the results of new analysis concerning the year 48 to 52, the years from 48 to 52 or so. Can you tell us more about that? I will when I receive them from Vienna. They're still there. So I uh, had hoped to have them today. That was everyone's hope. But uh, it's more important to have solid data that uh, are not rushed than to forever wonder whether we should have left them, you know, given them a li little bit more time and not forced July 11th as a spurious date. So we have to be a little more patient. Now we have a question now from uh, Brazil to Francine again and to, to Colin. And the question is this, can other materials be used for comparison or to show signals? I ask this because Brazilian researchers found cesium-137 in mud samples at the South Atlantic Ocean. Cesium-137 is one of the radionuclides that many of the teams identified in their records. Uh, and certainly that uh, we welcome other sites around the world comparing their findings with uh, the 12 sites that we studied and uh, with Crawford Lake. One of the issues with cesium-137 is his uh, very short half-life. So it has a practical usage now as we're trying to define units, but it, it has long, it's a very short duration record for future reference. So within probably 50 to 60 years, that sink will probably be lost. Um, also, in many environments, the cesium can be mobile. And I can't tell you with regard to the South Atlantic whether it would be, um, but it may not be as clear a record as we see at Crawford Lake. And I think the other thing is in, in deep marine successions, uh, and I'm assuming that's what you mean when you talk about South Atlantic, uh, here the, the Anthropocene will be very condensed. I mean, it may be just a few millimeters in thickness. So recognizable at the surface by things like the cesium-137, but actually having a, a profile that we could anal analyze the transition from the Holocene through the Anthropocene uh, wouldn't probably be recognizable in such a thin succession. Thank you very much. Now we have a more general question from Sarah Kaplan from the Washington Post. And she says, the question is for anyone who would like to answer. Uh, what is the significance of this stratigraphic evidence for people who are not geologists? What does it mean for someone going about their day-to-day -day lives, whether or not we are living in the Anthropocene? I think this is a question for my two neighbors here. Who wants to start? Um, my first point would be, uh, we just have to acknowledge that the, uh, that the natural sciences from the 19th century on defined what uh, the material reality we are living in is. So our reality construction in the Western world is really based on the sciences. So uh, the acknowledgement that there is a new uh, Earth epoch now uh, and the implications of this new Earth epoch that is uh, produced by human beings who really are uh, putting in danger the Earth system is on all levels in society important. It's uh, important as far as politics is concerned. It's important as far as uh, I tried to uh, mention that knowledge production in the sciences is concerned. But it's also the question of everyday life. How do, uh, do I need a car? Uh, each day, or do I put the car just one hour? Uh, um, oh, I use the car just one hour a day, and 23 hours it's, uh, 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 it's uh, taking space in the city. Uh, so, so there are 
on all levels of life, up from the politics, uh, uh, sciences, economy, of course, up to the individual way of life, uh, um, uh, we have to transform our way we relate to the world. That is basically uh, the message, I would say. It's also a wake-up call, isn't it? Yeah, I think Bernd has mentioned uh, already several um, points why it is important. I think it's 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 a clear signifier uh, for for all of us, and um, it's to make us aware um, in which time we are living, and um, that it's time uh, to to act. And um, as well, what what Bernd was saying, uh, which is very important, and what we try to. Uh, to mark out uh, in our previous statements as well uh, the importance of, of of these collaborations between the disciplines uh, and between the fields um, to get one step further and as well to find a common language. It is really hard uh, to to find this com uh, this, 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 this common language, um, but it's worthwhile uh, to go for it and to fight for it. Only add it's a call to uh, global responsibility. We as humans, every one of us has uh, their share of global responsibility and the Anthropocene reminds us of that. There is one last question uh, by Tatsuya Ozaki from the Nikkei and it's a question to Francine. Finally, the Anthropocene Working Group officially announced that Crawford Lake has chosen the site. This is what just happened. And the question is, how do you feel now, Francine? <laughs> now I feel happy. In April, I felt relieved. Uh, so I feel uh, very privileged to have been part of this work. I think it is an important step for, well, obviously for the Anthropocene Working Group to, we have uh, reached uh, a uh, conclusion. Uh, I think for a little while, I feared that we would be deadlocked forever. So I'm glad that we have a conclusion. And of course, personally, I'm glad it's Crawford Lake, but I would have been almost as glad any other way. Um, and I think Crawford Lake is an excellent choice. Thank, thank you, Francine. Uh, I think it's worth an applause. Uh, two more questions, but I think we have to wrap up. One is by Earl Ellis. Alice, and he asked, given that evidence of anthropogenic global change is already extremely robust, why would a formal Anthropocene definition change anything about public perception of these changes? Um, I could give this question to the uh, geologist colleague over at Lille, but I could also try to give a short answer myself. I think it's, you know, uh, solidifying this collaboration that we have between various sciences, including the well-established geological sciences and their procedures. And as the Anthropocene has been a challenge to all of the sciences, I think the geologists are giving us an answer. And as I said in my introduction, it will provide us rock solid evidence that this term is on the, uh, on the time scale of earth history. Uh, one last uh, question uh, comes uh, from uh, a colleague who says, thank you for sharing this momentous occasion with the public. How will a golden spike be placed in mud in the bottom of a lake? So that's an that's, important question, question because it will not be at the bottom of the lake. And I have uh, assured the people at Conservation Halton that that will be made clear in signage because we do not want anyone to die trying to steal the golden spike from the lake. The, the if there is a golden spike, it will be affixed on the core in the cryogenic facility at the Canadian Museum of Nature under a lot of security. So no one will try to find it at the bottom of the lake, but there will be ample signage and um, information about the Anthropocene and the quest for the golden spike, etc at the interpretive center so people who visit Crawford Lake will get to experience that but they will all learn right away and in no uncertain terms that there is no spike at the bottom of the lake. Thank you. I said Francine this is reassuring thank you. Uh, now we close sort of the online conversation if there are 
Uh, any questions from the audience? I think we can take a few minutes for that. Yeah, I can see a question there in the back, but that question needs a mic. No, we can't. Unfortunately, I'm told by the organizers, you can ask, you can ask the question in private later on. I'm sorry. We have to close this session. Uh, you know, I'm just the moderator and not the organizer of this, so please bear with me. I thank you all for the attention. I thank in particular uh, our geologists in, uh, in Lille. Congratulations to a wonderful work to all of you. And I think it's, an, it's worth another applause. That time will take. Thank you for the participants here. Thank you for the audience. I now understand the Max Planck Climate uh, uh, Conference must go on. So <laughs> thank you very much. Have a good evening. <laughs>